Back in Seattle, I read the newspaper accounts of Ted's second escape incredulously. I had detected no hints at all that he had planned to bolt and run when we'd talked earlier on December 30th. But, of course, I would probably have been the last person he would telegraph his thoughts to. I was too close to the police, and yet he wanted to say goodbye. I studied a map of the United States. If I were Ted, where would I go? To a big city, certainly. And then where? Would he bury himself in a sea of faces in a metropolis? Or would he try to cross national borders? He had asked for my address in Los Angeles. I felt a vague stirring of unease. Los Angeles was a big city indeed, and only 120 miles from the Mexican border. The FBI came to the same conclusion. Ray Mathis, in charge of public information for the Seattle office of the FBI, and an old friend, a man I had once introduced Ted to at a Christmas party, called and asked for my address in Los Angeles. He wanted to know when I would be flying down to California. I had planned to leave on January 4th, but my car had been struck from behind by a drunk driver. It had almost totaled the first new car I had ever had and left me with severe whiplash. I put off my flight until January 6th. Ray gave me the names of two agents in charge of the fugitive unit in the Los Angeles FBI office. Call them the minute you get off the plane. They'll be in touch with you, watching you. We don't know where he is, but he may try to contact you there. All of this was unreal. Only a few years before, I had been, if there is such a creature, a typical housewife, a brownie leader. Now I was off to Hollywood to write a movie with the FBI waiting for me. I felt as if I belonged in an episode of Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. The two FBI agents met me as I arrived at the new apartment in West Hollywood. They checked the double locks on the door and found them sound, satisfied themselves that the third floor apartment was not accessible from the ground. Any intruder would have to shinny up the reed-thin bamboo trees. Do you think he'll call you? I don't know, I said. He has my address and my phone number. If he does, don't let him come here. Arrange to meet him someplace in public. A restaurant. Then call us. We'll be in disguise at another table. I had to smile. The ghost of J. Edgar Hoover still prevailed. I had always found that FBI agents looked exactly like FBI agents, and I commented on my impression. They were chagrined and assured me that they were masters of disguise. If I doubted their expertise at disguise, I did appreciate their concern, however. I have often been grateful that Ted did not run in my direction. I was saved a scene I could only imagine. All writers have a sense of the dramatic, but I couldn't quite see Anne Rule from the little town of Des Moines, Washington, in the midst of an arrest of one of the country's ten most wanted criminals, and that criminal being an old friend. Joyce Johnson, who was to be a faithful, if sometimes needling, correspondent during my sojourn in Hollywood, wrote, Dear Anne, just to let you know I am protecting your interests here in the police department. I told Captain Letch that you were hiding Ted in your apartment, and he is mad. He says you'll never get to write another story, but he really likes the new guy who's writing crime stories and lets him see all the files. If you and Ted go to Mexico, send me a postcard. Love, Joyce. The weeks ahead were uncomfortable, but not frightening. I had no fear of Ted Bundy, even if he was what he was said to be a mass murderer. I still felt he would never harm me, but neither could I help him in his escape. That was something I just couldn't do. When I returned to my apartment complex each night, I parked my rental car in the dark underground garage, traversed its length, and emerged among the lush flowering shrubbery that threatened to overgrow the swimming pool. Shadows were everywhere, and the last stretch of sidewalk before I came to my building in the rear of the complex was pitch dark. The lights had burned out. I sprinted for the door, pushed the elevator button, made sure no one was inside the self-operated lift, and ran from there to the door of my apartment. Actually, I was more leery of some of the peculiar occupants of my building than I was of bumping into Ted. He was a known quality to me. They were not. My only fear as far as Ted was concerned was that I didn't want to have to face turning him in. I needn't have worried. On the night I arrived at the Los Angeles airport on January 6th, Ted was pulling out of Ann Arbor. Michigan, my girlhood home, in a stolen car, headed for Tallahassee, Florida. By the time Marty Davidson and I began to work on our script in earnest, Ted was comfortably ensconced in the oak in Tallahassee, calling himself Chris Hagen. If he thought of me at all, it was only passing. I was part of the other world, the world left behind forever. Living in his shabby room, Ted was happy and contented as he'd been in years, just to open his eyes in the morning and see the old wood door, paint peeling and scarred instead of a solid steel door, was glorious. 
At first, simply freedom itself was enough. He was around people, part of a college group, a group that he always found healthy and exciting. He had meant to be completely and utterly law-abiding, to get by without a car, without even a bicycle. He had meant to get a job, construction work preferably, but maybe even as a janitor. He wasn't in as good physical shape as he had been most of his life. The months in jail had caused his taut muscle tone to waste away, despite the pacing he'd done in his cell, despite the push-ups and sit-ups he'd made himself do faithfully. And then, he was drastically underweight. He'd had to starve himself so he could get through the hole in the ceiling. It would take a while to build up again. He had gone through the records of graduates at the Florida State University and decided that a graduate student named Kenneth Meisner, a track star, would be the first man he'd be. He researched Meisner's family, his hometown. He had an ID card made up in Meisner's name, but he didn't want to use it yet. He needed a driver's license, other ID. After he had all the verification that he needed to prove he was Kenneth Meisner, that he would develop two or three more sets of ID, American first and then Canadian, but he mustn't hurry it. There was time now, all the time in the world. His days were simple. He arose at six and bought a small breakfast at the cafeteria on campus, skipped lunch, and had a hamburger for supper. In the evening, he walked to the store and bought a quart of beer, took it back to his room, and drank it slowly. God, freedom was so sweet. There was such pleasure in the simple things. He thought a lot about jail as he sipped the beer, smiling to himself as he went over the escape again and again. It had worked far better than he himself could have imagined. They had never understood what he was capable of. They'd been so grim and self-righteous about those damnable leg irons, irons they'd chained to the floor of their police cars. Hell, he had keys for those leg irons all along, made for him by a cellmate. He could have unlocked them at any time, but what good would it have done? Why should he jump out of a moving police car in the Winter Mountains when he could go through the ceiling any time he chose and get a 14 to 16 hour head start on the bastards? He knew he should be working harder at finding a job, but he had never been much of a job hunter. The days melted into each other, and it was all so good. He knew he was acquisitive, that things meant a lot to him. He had his apartment in Salt Lake City exactly as he wanted it, and the damn cops had taken it all away from him. Now he wanted some things to brighten up his world again. He passed the bicycle several times on his way to the store. It was a Raleigh. He'd always been partial to Raleigh's. They had a good, strong frame, but whoever owned this one apparently didn't give a damn about it. The tires were flat, and the rims were rusted. He took it, fixed the tires, polished up the rims. Riding it felt great. He'd ride it to the store to buy milk, and nobody ever looked twice at him. There were other things he took, things he needed, things anybody needed if they were going to live like a human being. Towels, cologne, a television set, racquetball rackets, and balls. Now he could play on the courts at FSU. In the evenings, he mostly stayed in his room, watching television, finishing off the beer. He tried to be in bed by 10 p.m. Stealing those things he needed seemed okay. It was like going to the supermarket and slipping a can of sardines into his pocket to have for supper. He had to steal if he wanted to have anything. The $60 left after he paid his deposit was melting away. No matter how spartan, he tried to keep his meals. Friends were one thing he really couldn't afford. There was an unemployed rock band living down the hall, and he chatted with them occasionally. But he couldn't get really close to anyone in the Oak. As far as his girlfriend, that was impossible. He had no past. He might only get attached to someone and then have to disappear. How could he approach a woman when he, Chris Hagen, Ken Meisner, who knows who else, had only been born a week before? With each day that passed, he berated himself because he wasn't actively looking for work. If he didn't have a job, there'd be no paychecks, and how was he going to explain that to the landlord of the Oak on February 8th, when the 320 came due? Still, he couldn't seem to make himself move on the job. It was too great just to be able to play ball, ride his bike, go to the library, watch TV, feel part of the human race again. His room was becoming better furnished all the time. It was so easy to pick things up. And then it was so easy to slip women's shoppers' wallets out of their purses left in shopping carts. Credit cards. Credit cards would buy anything. He just had to remember to keep changing them before they reported as stolen. The world owed Ted Bundy. It had taken everything he had away from him, and now he was just making up for those stolen years, those years of humiliation and deprivation. He was trained to take shortcuts. Maybe that's why he couldn't bring himself to take buses when it was so easy to steal a car.
He never kept them long. Later, he wouldn't even be able to count how many cars he'd stolen during the six weeks he spent as a free man in Florida. There was one he'd picked up in a Mormon church parking lot. He had only driven it a few blocks before he realized the thing didn't have any brakes. He'd kill himself if he tried to drive that one. He dumped it in another churchyard. And the thief that he was, he had ethics. There was one little Volkswagen that he had picked up, and he realized at once that it must belong to some young girl. It was old and had a couple hundred thousand miles on it, but she had it souped up and polished and reupholstered. It was clearly somebody's pride and joy, and he couldn't steal it. He made it a point to never steal from someone who couldn't afford it. If the car was new, loaded with fancy extras, that told him that the owner could afford to lose it. But the little Volkswagen, he couldn't steal that one. He parked it a few blocks from where he had taken it. And so the days passed in Tallahassee, warm, almost dreamy days, and chilly nights where he was safe in his room, watching television, planning for the future, a future he could not quite manage to get running smoothly. With the Florida metamorphosis, his appearance changed once again. Where he had been gaunt and skinny, the milk, beer, and junk food now began to add pounds. His face took on a rounded look. There was a hint of jowls around his chin. His body, trapped so long in the confines of a cell, built up muscle from the bike riding and racquetball. He kept his hair short, combed flat to discourage waves and curls. He'd always had the pronounced dark mole on the left side of his neck, one reason he'd worn turtlenecks almost exclusively. But none of the wanted posters mentioned it. Perhaps no one noticed it. Now he penciled in fake moles on the left cheek, started a real mustache. Other than that, he made no effort to disguise himself. He knew that he had been blessed with features that seemed to change imperceptibly through no will of his own. Always attractive, but somehow anonymous. He would capitalize on it. The one thing that ate at him was that he had no one to talk to. No one at all. Beyond the occasional, how you doing, exchange with the band guys down the hall, a few meaningless words with a pretty girl who also lived at the Oak. Before, although he had never been in a position and never really wanted to bear his soul, there had always been someone to talk to even if it had meant the rhetoric of the courtroom, jokes with the jailers. And there had been letters to write. Now there was no one. He had to savor what he had accomplished inside his own head, and the loneliness took much joy out of it. Theodore Robert Bundy had achieved a measure of frame back in the West. In Florida, he was nobody. There were no reporters fighting for interviews. No news cameras trained on him. He had been on stage, admittedly in a negative way. But he had been someone to reckon with. Ted Bundy had arrived on the Florida State University campus on Sunday morning, January 8, 1978, and settled into his room at the Oak. Unheralded, unrecognized, he moved about the campus, sometimes even sitting on classes, eating in the cafeteria, playing racquetball in the athletic complex south of the campus proper. He knew no one, and no one knew him. To the rest of the inhabitants of the college society, he was only a shadowy figure, a nobody. The Chi Omega Sorority House, a sprawling L-shaped edifice of brick and frame, is located at 661 W. Jefferson, only a few blocks away from the Oak, but it is a world apart, expensively constructed, clean, decorated with impeccable taste, one of the top sororities on campus, and a home for 39 co-eds and a house mother. I had pledged Chi Omega, another in the string of coincidences that have seemed to bind me to dead. Pledged it, indeed way back in 1950, in its new Delta chapter on the Willamette University campus in Salem, Oregon. I remember the white carnations, the treasured pin with the owl on the skull, and through the odd computer indexes of the brain, remembered even the secret password. But that was in the days when sentiment reigned, when we gathered breathlessly on the house balcony to hear serenades from fraternity boys, much as the first Chios did when the sorority was founded in the Deep South. The girls who lived in the Chio house in Tallahassee were young enough to be my daughters. The Chio Mega House on West Jefferson was the college home for the most beautiful, the brightest, the most popular, and as always the legacies pledged because their mothers and grandmothers had been Chios before them. Where we had been honor bound to be safely home by 8 p.m. on weeknights and 1 a.m. on weekends, there was no curfews in 1978. Each resident had memorized the combination locked to the back door, a door which opened into the rec room on the first floor. They could come and go at will, and on Saturday night, January 14, 1978, most of the girls who lived in the sorority were out very late, into the wee hours of the morning. There were several keggers on campus that night, functions that we had referred to as beer busts, and many of the chios were slightly intoxicated when they arrived home, 
perhaps that may explain in part how the horror could happen only thin walls away from the girls who were spared without their hearing so much as a football. The downstairs of the Chi Omega house contained the rec room, and to the west of it, a formal living room, seldom used except to entertain visiting alumni and during rush week. Beyond that were the dining room and the kitchen. There were two back staircases, one leading up to the sleeping rooms from the rec room, the route usually taken by the girls returning home late, and one opening off from the kitchen. The front staircase led up from the foyer just inside the double front doors. The foyer was papered in a bright metallic blue and was illuminated by a chandelier, illuminated quite brightly according to the witnesses who would testify later. For parents sending their cherished daughters off to the college, there would seem no safer place than a sorority house, full of other girls, watched over by a house mother, doors always locked. The only male usually allowed upstairs was Ronnie Egg, the houseboy who'd been dubbed the sorority sweetheart. All the Chios were fond of Ronnie, a dark, slender, shy young man. On that Saturday, most of the girls who lived in the Chi Omega house had plans for the evening. Margaret Bowman, 21, daughter of a wealthy and socially prominent family in St. Petersburg, Florida, was going out on a blind date at 9.30, a date arranged for her by her friend and sorority sister, Melanie Nelson. Lisa Levy, 20, also from St. Petersburg, had worked all day at her part-time job, and she decided she'd like to go out for a little while. Lisa and Melanie went to a popular campus disco, Sherrod's, which is located right next door to the Chi Omega house at 10 p.m. Karen Chandler and Kathy Kleiner, who were roommates and number eight in the sorority, went in opposite directions that evening. Karen went home to cook dinner for her parents and returned before midnight to work on a sewing project in her room. Kathy Kleiner attended a wedding with her fiancé and then went out to dinner with friends. Both of them were in their beds and sound asleep before midnight. Nita Neary and Nancy Dowdy had two dates that night. They would not return until late. Mom, Crenshaw, the housekeeper, retired around 11. She was on call if her girls needed her. Lisa Levy was tired from her day's work and stayed only about half an hour at Sherrod's. Then she left, alone, and walked next door to the Chi Omega house and went to bed in number four. Her roommate had gone home for the weekend. Sherrod's many levels were crowded that night, as they always were on the weekends. Mulaney sat with another sorority sister, Leslie Waddell, and Leslie's boyfriend, a Sigma Chi. Mary Ann Picano was at Shiraz that night, too, accompanied by her apartment mate, Connie Hastings. Mary Ann had somewhat disturbing encounter with a man she had never seen before. The slender, brown-haired man had stared at her until she grew uncomfortable. There was something about the way his eyes bore into her that made her skin crawl. At length, he had come over to her table, bringing her a drink and asking her to dance. He was handsome enough, and there was no rational reason for her to feel so wary, no reason to refuse, really. Shiraz was a place where one often danced with strangers. But as she rose to join him on the dance floor, she whispered to Connie, I think I'm about to dance with an ex-con. During the dance, he did and said nothing to substantiate her gut feeling about him, but she found herself trembling. She couldn't look at him, and when the music finally ended, she had returned gratefully to her table. When she looked for him later, he was gone. Mulaney, Leslie, and her friend left Sherrod's a little after two, when it was closed, and walked next door. When they reached the back door, Mulaney commented to Leslie that the combination lock wasn't working. This is strange, she murmured. The door isn't locked. Leslie only shrugged. They had been having trouble with the doors closing and locking tightly for the past few days. The trio walked through the rec room, lighted now with only a dim table lamps. Margaret Bowman was already home and was waiting in the rec room, anxious to talk to Mulaney about her date. Leslie's boyfriend didn't have a ride home, and Margaret loaned Leslie the keys to her car. Mulaney and Margaret walked to Mulaney's room, discussing the events of Margaret's date while Mulaney got into her pajamas. Then they walked to Margaret's room, number nine, and continued to talk as Margaret undressed. Nancy Dowdy returned from her dinner date a few minutes after Mulaney and Leslie did. She too found the door mechanism ineffective and tried to make sure the door was shut tight. She paused for a moment at the top of the stairs to say goodnight to Mulaney and Margaret and went to bed. She was asleep by 2.15. It was 2.35 a.m. exactly on Margaret's clock when Mulaney said goodnight to her. Margaret only wore her bra and panties at that time. Mulaney shut the door to Margaret's room tightly, heard it click, and then walked down the hall to the bedroom where she chatted with another sorority sister, Terry Murphy, who had just gotten off work at Sherrod's. The time sequence would become extremely important.
Melanie Nelson had a digital clock in her room, and she glanced at it as she turned out the light. It was 2.45 a.m. She was asleep almost at once. It was 3 a.m. when Nita Neary arrived at the Chi Omega house, accompanied by her boyfriend. They had attended one of the beer parties on campus, but Nita had only a few beers. She had a cold and wasn't feeling very well. When Nita came back to the back room, she found it standing open. This didn't particularly alarm her. She too was aware that it hadn't been working right. Nita stepped inside and moved through the rec room, turning off the lights. Suddenly, she heard a loud thump. Her first thought was that her date had tripped and fallen on his way to his car. She ran to the window, but saw that he was fine, just getting into his vehicle. A moment later, she heard running footsteps in the corridor above. Nita moved to the doorway leading into the foyer, hidden there from anyone coming down the front stairs. She could see the foyer well. The chandelier was still lit. The double white doors were about 16 feet away. The footsteps sounded on the front stairway now, running, and then she saw him. A slender man, wearing a dark jacket, a navy blue knit cap which she called a toboggan, something like a watch cap, was pulled down over the top of half his face. She saw him only in profile, but she couldn't make out a sharp nose. The man was crouched over, his left hand on the doorknob, and in his right hand, incredibly, he held a club, a club that seemed to be a log. She could see it was rough, as it was covered with bark. At the base of the club where he had held it, there was some cloth wrapped around it. One second. Two. Three. And the door was open, and the man was gone. Thoughts flashed through Nita Neary's mind. She hadn't had time to be frightened. She thought, we've been burglarized. Or maybe one of the girls had the nerve to sneak somebody upstairs. The only man who she was used to seeing around the sorority house was Ronnie Egg. And for a moment, she wondered, what was Ronnie doing here? She hadn't seen the man's eyes at all. Only that glimpse, now frozen in her conscious mind, of the crouching figure with the club. She ran up the stairs and woke her roommate, Nancy Dowdy. There's someone in the house, Nancy. I just saw a man leave. Nancy grabbed the first thing at hand, her umbrella, and the two girls tiptoed downstairs. They checked the front door and found it locked. Nita had shut and locked the rear door when she came in. They debated what they should do. Call the police? Wake Mom Crenshaw? Nothing seemed to be missing. Nothing seemed to be wrong. Nita demonstrated to Nancy the way the man had crouched, described the club. At first I thought it was Ronnie, but this man was, like, larger and taller than Ronnie. They walked back up the stairs, still discussing what they should do. As they reached the top, they saw Karen Chandler come out of the number eight and begin to run down the hall. She was staggering, and she held her head in both hands. They assumed she was ill, and Nancy ran after her. Karen's head was covered with blood, blood that streamed down her face, and she seemed to be delirious. Nancy led her into her own room and gave her a tower to help staunch the flow of blood. Nita ran to wake Mom Crenshaw and then went into number eight, the room Karen shared with Kathy Miner. Kathy sat in her bed, holding her head in her hands. She was moaning unintelligibly, and blood gushed from her head, too. Nancy Dowdy dialed 911, almost hysterical herself, and said that help was needed at once at the Chi Omega house at 661 West Jefferson. The first call was garbled. The dispatcher understood that two females were fighting over a boyfriend. That was the way Tallahassee police officer Oscar Brannon received the call. To my sadness, he would later remark, I found out quite differently. Brannon was a mile or two away from the Chio house and arrived at 3.23 a.m., Within three minutes, he was joined by a fellow Tallahassee officer, Henry Newkirk, Florida State University police officers Ray Crew and Bill Taylor, and paramedics from Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. Neither the officers nor the paramedics had any idea what lay ahead of them. Brandon and Taylor remained downstairs and got a description of the man Nita had seen and broadcasted to all units working the area. Crew and Newkirk ran upstairs. Mrs. Crenshaw and eight or ten of the girls were milling around in the hall. They pointed to Karen and Kathy. Both girls seemed to be terribly injured. Paramedics Don Allen, Amelia Roberts, Lee Finney, and Gary Matthews were directed to the second floor where the victims lay moaning. Allen and Roberts worked on Kathy Kleiner. Kathy was conscious, but she had lacerations and puncture wounds on her face, a broken jaw, broken teeth, and possible skull fractures. Someone had given her a container to catch the blood that gushed from her mouth. She called for her boyfriend and for her pastor. 
She had no idea at all what had happened to her. She had been sound asleep. Alan's supervisor, Lee Finney, moved to help Karen Chandler. She, too, had a broken jaw, broken teeth, possible fractures of the skull, and cuts. The paramedics fought to open an airway for both the injured girls to keep them from choking to death on their own blood. The injured girl's room, number eight, looked like an abattoir, with blood sprayed on the light walls, bits of bark, oak bark, covered their pillows and bed clothing. Karen did not remember anything either. She too had been sleeping when the man had hammered blows on her head. Pandemonium reigned. While the other policemen moved down the corridor, checking room by room, Officer Newkirk gathered the girls into number two. No one could answer his questions. No one had heard a thing. Officer Ray Crew came to number four, Lisa Levy's room, with Miss Crenshaw trailing behind. Lisa had gone to bed around 11, and she apparently hadn't awakened, despite the chaos on the second floor. Crew opened up Lisa's door. He saw her laying on her right side, the covers pulled up over her shoulders. The house mother told Crew her name. Lisa? There was no answer. Lisa, wake up! Crew called. The figure on the bed didn't move at all. Crew reached over to shake her shoulder gently, started to roll her over on her back. It was then that he observed a small blood stain on the sheet beneath her. He turned to Miss Crenshaw and said tightly, Get the medics. Don Allen grabbed his gear and ran to Lisa. The paramedic searched for a pulse and found none. He pulled her onto the floor and immediately began mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and cardiopulmonary massage. Lisa's complexion was pallid, her lips blue, her skin already cooling, and yet the paramedics could not see exactly what was wrong with her. She wore only a nightgown. Her panties lay on the floor beside the bed. Alan cut off her nightgown, searching for some injury that had caused her condition. He saw pronounced swelling around her jaw, a condition usually produced by strangulation, and an injury on her right shoulder, an ugly purpling bruise. Her right nipple had been bitten almost off. 